So, in the last class we saw that Laplace's equation discretized could be written as a system of equations. In fact, uh, I just wrote that as a phi uh, equals some b <coughs> to keep the conversation general keep the conversation general right I will switch to the standard notation that you are used to which is Ax equals b I will put a tilde under the x to indicate that it is a vector fine and also so that we do not confuse it I mean after all we were doing xy coordinates and so on so that we do not confuse it with the xy there. So we are basically solving the system Ax equals b okay and there were two schemes that we saw one was the Jacobi iteration and the other was basically Gauss Seidel you may not have realized it the other scheme that we basically used to solve that system of equations was Gauss Seidel okay. Now what I want to do is both of these schemes are iterative schemes as opposed to direct schemes like Gaussian elimination right or an equivalent which is LU decomposition okay. So we are not talking about using uh, a direct method, direct methods uh, direct methods like we would not do this like uh, either Gaussian elimination we are not going to do this or equivalently LU decomposition. you can actually show that these two are equivalent to each other okay the elimination and the back substitution part turns out to be the same as doing the LU decomposition. So we are going with iterative schemes okay we are going with iterative schemes to solve this in the context of Laplace equation it is called a relaxation scheme okay. Now what we will do is we will see we will write try to write these in the iterative form that we have actually written for phi okay in a recursive form that we have actually written for phi. In order to do that I need to partition A I want to partition A that means I want to write A as the sum of various parts as the sum of three parts D, L and U this is basically where we ended in the last class. So if the entry is in A or Aij entries in A or Aij the entries in D or Dij correspondingly you have Lij and Uij I am defining I am defining my D as the diagonal terms D or am I defining D Dij equals Aij if i equals j equals 0 otherwise for those of you who have already seen upper triangular and lower triangular matrices this may just be a repeat but let me just for completion let me just write this out. So for L Lij is Aij if i less than j okay and it equal, equals 0 otherwise and u oh that is full which is uij is aij if the opposite of that i greater than j and 0 otherwise. So basically this will give me the diagonal elements this will give me the elements below the diagonal this will give me the elements above the diagonal okay. So I have partitioned my matrix A in this fashion let us just take one let us just take one equation that we did from Gauss uh, Jacobi and see what what we are talking about. So when the, the uh, Laplace's equation when we were doing the regular Jacobi iteration basically was phi i j at n plus 1 is one quarter I 
I will write a 0 here which was the right hand side of the equation del squared nabla squared phi equals 0 plus uh, phi i plus 1 j n plus phi i phi i j plus 1 n plus phi i minus 1 j n plus phi i j minus 1 n. This is this would basically be the zero here is basically the right hand side. The right hand side happened to be zero. Okay, that happened. That that's the entry in B. That's the entry in B. Okay, so if I look at this Jacobi iteration, basically, this what is this 0.25? That's one divided by four. This is one divided by four, which is essentially d inverse. That corresponds to d inverse. So looking at this by inspection, I say that my x at n plus 1 is d inverse b minus l plus u times x at n is that fine everybody so I can rearrange terms I get x n plus 1 is some p times x n plus a c right and what is p what is the matrix p minus d inverse l plus u okay this is called an iteration matrix so p is a iteration matrix we can write it we can write it in this we can write it in this form okay so this is p that would be jacobi i'll put a j there p jacobi okay what about Gauss Seidel? Gauss Seidel is going to have if we did Gauss Seidel instead, we had phi i j n plus 1 equals 0 0.25 times my right hand side happens to be 0, I am just picking some arbitrary entry plus phi i plus 1 j n plus phi i j plus 1 n plus phi i minus 1 j n plus 1 plus phi i j minus 1 n plus 1 this is of course assuming that I am going from the lower left hand corner right left to right bottom to top there is a implicit assumption on the sweep direction okay so these basically come from the n plus 1 side these basically come from the n plus 1 side okay in a sense that is like saying that we have uh, we have we are solving let me just so let me take let me take these over to that side right let me take these over to that side okay so that would be like saying I am so I am undoing whatever we did I am I am undoing it right to just get the matrix form okay. So what we have? So we have uh, phi i a minus phi i minus one j n plus one a minus phi i j minus one n plus either multiplied by 0 0.25 or we can take that get that 4 out 4 times phi i j n plus 1 and this equals 0 plus phi i plus 1 j n plus phi i j plus 1 n okay 
what is this this is the diagonal term this is D this is L right so this is L plus D minus L D minus L into phi at n plus 1 equals b plus u times uh, I am using x x tilde u times x n is that fine. So Gauss side L turns out to be x n plus 1 equals d minus l inverse b plus u x n tilde we have to be a bit careful with the uh, signs because really the way we had written a this would have been minus 4 and those would have been plus 1 okay you have to be a bit careful with the signs we have to be a bit careful with the signs. Should it be D plus L? Have I made a mistake? No, they are opposite signs. You are right. D plus L. Because the signs are right. Okay. D plus L. The diagonals and the off diagonal terms are of opposite sign in the original matrix okay. So actually in the original matrix from the original matrix this is actually minus D minus of D plus L from the original matrix this is minus of D plus L and this is okay you have to be a bit careful okay that is fine right. Yet again we are able to write we are able to write that matrix for Gauss Seidel Gauss Seidel as xn plus 1 is P Gauss Seidel xn plus a C. The C is of course also a C Gauss Seidel right the C's are not C's C's are also C's are also dependent on is that fine everybody okay and the P is called the iteration matrix we can actually figure out now that uh, you can ask the question if you are going through we have the iteration matrix if you are going through the iteration you are generating given an x0 you are generating a x1 given the x1 you are generating an x2 you are generating a sequence now we have a form that relates one to the other in a simple right uh, equation something at least that, that the chalk dust looks as though it can be written simply we can ask ourselves the question is there a way for us to do an analysis of this okay is there a way for us to figure out to analyze this to analyze this problem so does it converge does the sequence that we get does it converge in the last class we saw that we could use the Cauchy test to decide whether convergence occurs, occurs or not uh, here we will see what else we can do so we start with this equation okay and uh, so I will just write this in this general form either whether it is Gauss Seidel or or Jacobi iteration whatever iteration we will see how, how to do the analysis for that. So coming back here what we basically do is so the general form that we have is x at n plus 1 is some p times x at n plus a c this is the general form that we have is that okay. So you will guess an x0. And get a, and get an x1. That's what you're going to do, and then get an x2. From there, you're going to get an x2, and so on. You're going to generate the sequence xn. The actual solution to this equation, we will represent by x. So the solution that we want is x. Is that fine? What do I mean by that? That means that if x is the solution this implies x equals 
px plus c. So, from this equation if I subtract out the equation with the solution that satisfies the solution from this if I subtract out that okay if I subtract out that I will get an error essentially what I am saying is if at any given time I have a candidate solution x n right I know my actual solution x the difference between them I will define as the error e n also happens to be a vector is that okay everyone that is fine. So if, if I subtract from this equation I subtract this equation this is both of them are linear fortunately I am using that fact then I get the iteration equation En plus 1 equals P times En and by converting to En what I have achieved though what is the difference there is a difference the C is gone the C is gone. And now I can ask the question do the sequence of En's go to 0 I am generating a sequence so my iterations are basically generating E0, E1, E2, En and the question is does the sequence converge and you want it to converge to 0 in this case we know we know earlier it had to converge to a solution we do not know what the solution is okay in this case we know that this has to go to 0. Fine. So, in order to do that, if this were a if this were a scalar equation, you would do a ratio test. Okay. If this were a scalar equation, you would do a ratio test. So, let us look at how we go about analyzing this. So, please bear this in mind. We are going to come back to this equation now. I am going to do uh, I am not actually going to do fixed point theory, but I am going to talk some about something called a fixed point fixed point theory we are not actually going to do fixed point theory right but we are actually going to talk about fixed points. So in general in general an equation of this form okay so what is a fixed point of course I suddenly introduced this idea of a fixed point. So uh, x is a x, x is x is uh, x is a fixed point or e here is a fixed point right if uh, it turns out that you are you actually get psi equals p times psi psi is a fixed point right so if you substitute psi back into the equation on the right hand side you get back psi okay so when does when do we when do we do this in general this equation in general looks something of the form xn plus 1 equals g of xn g is some arbitrary function okay so most iterations will look like this you will have some function you give me an xn you give me a guess we perform some magic and you get a new xn plus 1 right so and this is a particular case of that this is a particular case of that so the question is if you have some if you have something of this nature if you have something of this nature when does it have a fixed point that is when will I have a psi so that psi equals g of psi okay I am not going to talk about it in this general context I will still talk about it only in this context but I want you to see that so that is a question that you can ask and what do g and my p what do they do what do they do given a given a psi so what g and g and uh, p do is if you take if you take if you take a psi in the domain of definition of g the domain of definition of g you understand what I am saying so those are the set of values for which g will give you an answer meaningful answer it is defined g is defined on those set of values it will return a psi that you can plug back in that means g maps psi basically back into the domain the domain in the range of the same it is important right so this this equation the way we have set it up the way we have set it up for it to work g has to map any argument of its own back into the domain am I making sense right so g or p for instance if you say that 
if you say that I have I have some interval on which g is defined. So what g has to basically do is uh, you you take uh, let let's take x constraint if we constrained x to 0 to pi by 2 and I am looking at x equals sin of x xn plus 1 equals sin of xn am I making sense okay in fact instead of pi by 2 I could have even taken 1 0 to 1 then it turns out that right if, if I had even taken x is in 0 to 1 then this will constrain okay this will, this will map back not constrain sin x maps back into the interval 0 1 right for this if I start off here I am guaranteed that I am going to be in that interval sin x is not going to take me out of that interval does that make sense okay. So first that it maps back into itself the second question that we have is is that enough for us to be able to guarantee that there is a psi which is g of psi and that we are going to get to it okay. So is there so the fixed point theory basically tells you when is the when you have a fixed point as I said I am not going to really sit down and state and prove the theorem but we will just look at the essentials of uh, fixed point theory that we require because it is pretty intuitive. Let us take an example similar to that but let us take a scalar so I will remove the tilde I have an x no tilde underneath this is a scalar x equals alpha xn plus 1 is alpha xn these are just numbers what will this generate for a given alpha what is the kind of series this will generate what is the sequence it generates it will generate a geometric sequence okay so and when does that converge so you want mod alpha less than 1 so mod alpha less than 1 will guarantee that this will converge to there is a fixed point it will converge to 0 okay so there is another situation where there are fixed points if alpha equals 1 then every point is a fixed point right if alpha equals 1 every every point is a fixed point okay so there are there are two so mod alpha less than 1 and alpha equals 1 right both of them both of them will work uh, we will see where this takes us so it is possible that if mod alpha less than 1 you will generate a sequence that converges okay and basically there in a sense you did a ratio test actually doing a ratio test there okay this is not the Cauchy test okay what if I had a second sequence yn plus 1 now I will make this alpha x alpha y yn so you can ask me the question where the heck are these where where are these coming from where 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 are these sequences coming from so these sequences correspond let I am not going to give you an actual problem but let us in our mind imagine that we are solving a problem and because of knowledge that I have right I pick a coordinate system and I pick a convenient coordinate system I pick a convenient coordinate I look at my problem and I pick a coordinate system I have some I have some knowledge right in my in fluid mechanics or whatever it is I look at the problem and say this is a convenient coordinate system and in this coordinate system I get these two equations okay which if I iterate gives me some answer to a fluid mechanics problem it does not matter what is the problem okay what is important is that I picked a convenient coordinate system and that I have deliberately set the convenient coordinate system at an angle here obviously right the coordinate system is not is convenient to the problem so I have picked a convenient coordinate system and I have I have these two equations that come that come out of my problem just like we got a system of equations from Laplace equation right in a similar fashion I do some magic in my fluid mechanics or whatever and I end up with these two equations and if I solve these two equations I solve my problem that is all we need to know we do not need to know what the problem is. So I can now generate iterates right so I will generate a sequence xn x, x0 uh, y0 x1 y1 x2 y2 xn yn am I making sense and when do these converge 
when do these converge you want mod alpha x you want mod alpha x less than 1 and you want mod alpha y less than 1 is that fine or in general or in general I can write it in a different way because I have an and you can say max of mod alpha x mod alpha y less than 1 maximum of those two is less than 1 then that x not y not that sequence will converge fine any questions so if I have three equations instead of two equations then I, it would be max of alpha x alpha y alpha z and so on okay the, the largest one has to be the magnitude has to be less than one okay but see in real life this does not always happen this way normally what happens is we have a problem we may not know we may not know of a convenient coordinate system to start with okay so this is basic this coordinate system here I have clearly drawn it this way it is a setup right in reality what you would have done and what you have seen me always do is I will draw a coordinate system this way I will have an x prime I do not I want to call it something else a psi eta coordinate system this way in real life that is what would happen you draw a coordinate system typically parallel to your page because you have no other reason to pick a coordinate system right if you had knowledge about the solution you would pick a convenient coordinate system but sometimes we do not do it does not happen sometimes we think deep think of a coordinate system draw it and it turns out it is not really the convenient coordinate system right we try we try we try our best so let us say you had picked this coordinate system instead okay but this is the underlying sequence that you are going to generate so how do I transform this into the new coordinate system I just have to rotate the coordinates okay in order to rotate the coordinates I will first write that x n plus 1 I will write those as a in a matrix form because I am going to do some matrix manipulation here right is that okay this is the same same iteration matrix and these converge these that is if I call this x n plus 1 is some let me make it capital lambda this is this matrix it contains alphas right capital Y and uh, X n so the matrix form of this equation can be written this fashion and it looks suspiciously like what we are talking about earlier this looks the reason why I am doing this it looks very much like E n plus 1 is P times E n that is where we are going and this sequences of, of x's x0 x1 x2 xn converges if the maximum of alpha x and alpha y are modulus alpha x alpha y are less than 1 that is what we have now if we had picked a different coordinate system which was at an angle theta with respect to the convenient coordinate system x y if you had actually picked a different coordinate system then we can go from one coordinate system to another coordinate system by performing a rotation okay so rotation matrix r basically is cos theta sin theta is a entries in a unit vector right minus sin theta cos theta orthogonal matrix so if I take this if I take this equation if I take this equation and pre multiplied by r so I pre multiplied by r r x n plus 1 will give me psi okay the vector psi which consists consists of the entries uh, so r x n plus 1 let me see I will write that here so this equation turns out to be r x n plus 1 I am sorry r x n plus 1 we need to give it some nice symbol 
I'll I'll use uh, I'll use uh, the capital Xi doesn't look that good, so I'll use Xi with a tilde underneath. Okay, just bear with the notation, right? So that if I take this equation R X n plus one equals Xi n plus one equals R lambda. So I stick an R R inverse in with R inverse R there X n. So this tells me Xi n plus one equals if I call this matrix A A times Xi n. Okay. These are these are the vectors that we get in the second set of coordinates right so depending on your coordinate system the equations that you get will change the iteration goes on but if you could rotate from one coordinate system to another coordinate system you may actually find that there is a convenient coordinate system in which the equations decouple right so all of your you know where I am headed now right so this matrix R matrix is often called the modal matrix we will come back to this later we will need this okay and the alpha x and alpha y what are these called alpha x and alpha y are eigenvalues eigenvalues fine and uh, these of course will correspond to Eigen vectors right these are Eigen values so if you have a matrix A it has Eigen values which are alpha x and alpha y so if you were to do this iteration Xi n plus 1 equals A Xi n if you were to do this iteration right or you were to do the iteration E n plus 1 is P E n what we are going to say is if this this sequence of size that you get will converge if max of the Eigen value is less than 1 the modulus of the Eigen value is less than 1 if the largest Eigen value is less than 1 is that fine everyone okay right so En plus 1 equals P En this iteration matrix generates a sequence and that sequence converges if the largest the modulus of the largest Eigen value is less than 1 okay so now we have we have reduced finding that fixed point to finding out what is the largest Eigen value and if you know that the largest Eigen value is less than 1 you are you are set in the sense that at least you know that you have the you are going to get to the fixed point so how does this work this is this by the way uh, this mapping I, I forgot to mention this earlier this mapping this mapping or that xn plus 1 equals uh, g of x n see this maps into itself but this mapping when mod al, uh, alpha x is less than 1 right basically what is happening is there is a shrinking that is happening it is called a contraction mapping that is if you if you take values if you take values in a in a in a certain interval it will map into a smaller interval it is called a contraction mapping I will just write that here contraction mapping so the mapping is not only into itself it is a contraction mapping the typical example that I would give for this would be you imagine uh, uh, you can imagine a steel rod but it is easier to think of a piece of sponge right so you take a prismatic piece piece of foam or something of that sort that you can squeeze with your hand easily so you sit down and make markings on it at equal intervals so if I take that foam and the contraction mapping that I do is that is easy I squeeze right so I hold the foam in, in my hand or I hold it in a vice something of that sort and I squeeze so when I squeeze the right extreme moves in the left extreme moves in all of the points move there is one point that does not change you understand what there is a fixed point even in that example there is a fixed point so if I go through a contraction mapping there is still a fixed point there is one point that does not move am I making sense right I mean I do not have the foam in my hand but I think you can imagine it right okay so there is one point that does not change so if you have a contraction mapping right well yeah you could have a translation which is why I got rid of the C okay so you see that is that is the issue so if I if I were to translate if I did not if I did not 
if I did not push them together, if I did not push them together in the, in the, in the proper fashion, it is possible that I could, I could actually have a, I could have a translation. Now you will know why I moved to the En plus 1, okay, because I had got rid of the C. I want something that is linear. I want something that is linear. Remember, remember there is a standard confusion. The standard equation, this is outside the full discuss, normal discussion mx plus c, y equals mx plus c is not linear, right. This, this is not linear. It is a straight line. Unfortunately, linear also means line, right. So, curvy linear does not mean, means, then you will get confused. If you assume linear means straight line, curvy linear does not make sense, right. Curvy linear means a curved line, right. Okay, so y equals mx plus c is not linear in the sense of a function is linear. Okay, is that fine? Remember that. So we got rid of that c by going switching to the error. It is a little game that we play. Now, so if you have a so the fixed point theorem basically says, right? You have this map. I am not going to go through all the details, but you have a map back into the domain, and it's a contraction mapping, right? Then there is there is a fixed point, and you can get to that fixed point. In this case, because we are generating a sequence that will help us converge, so the our automaton will actually converge because of this, because of the fact that we have a contraction map. Is that fine? Are there any questions? Okay, no, that's fine. So now the thing is, how do we deal with this? We have reduced. We have reduced ourselves going from E n plus 1 is P times E n. How do we find out what are the largest eigenvalues and eigenvectors? Instead of dealing with this directly, I will deal with Laplace's equation itself directly. So in Laplace's equation, if phi is the solution and phi tilde or phi capital phi is a candidate, right. And this of course will give us a corresponding E, this will give us an E, okay. And we have seen when we talked about uniqueness, what are the boundary conditions that E satisfies? Well, this is, well let us call it En. What is the boundary condition that En satisfies? It will be 0, right. The boundary condition will be 0 because we have subtracted from the original which satisfies the boundary condition. See the candidate has to satisfy the boundary condition exactly. You cannot violate the boundary conditions are inviolate. You cannot violate the boundary condition. You can do whatever you want on the interior. You cannot violate the boundary conditions. Okay, so the can, candidate uh, solution also satisfies the boundary condition. Therefore, this is zero. This has homogeneous boundary conditions. It is zero on the boundaries. Okay, so how are we going to go about solving this? I cook up. I do use my Fourier series. I'll write Fourier series in two dimensions. If you have not seen this, you'll see how this works. So I look at this function e x y a l m uh, okay a l m you know that these are Fourier coefficients and not the entries of the matrix a i g you understand what I am saying do not confuse them with the entries of the matrix a a l m exponent i pi L x by capital L. L is the length of the domain. In our case, it's one, but I'll just I will I'll just leave it as capital L. Exponent i pi m y by capital L. Right, so instead of a 1 by 1 unit square, I have an L by L. This is summed over M, summed over L. I know in, I know I am going to use a grid of a certain size, right. If I have n intervals, then what is the highest frequency that I can represent? So here I do not have a 2 pi should have been 2 pi right it is only pi. So this goes from m equals 1 through n minus 1, l equals 1 through n minus 1. I have dropped the uh, m equals 
0 and L equals 0 because my boundary conditions are 0 right my boundary conditions are 0 Laplace equation maximum minimum occurs on the boundary blah okay fine right you know that it is going to go to 0 anyway so I have dropped the DC component m equals 0 component so I have m equals 1 so what is the relationship what is what is the relationship between E x y and Laplace's equation if I substitute this into Laplace equation what will happen if I substitute this into Laplace equation what will happen Nabla squared what is Nabla squared of E x y minus pi pi squared L squared by L squared minus pi squared M squared by L squared is that right you can just check to make sure that I have not so if I take any one of these for M equals 1 or 2 or 3 or what if I take any any one of these and this is what I am going to get is that fine just substitute it and try it just substitute it and try it so these are basically now look at what we have just done these are basically Eigen function these are Eigen values these are Eigen values and these are Eigen vectors or Eigen functions okay they are Eigen vectors or Eigen functions fine so these are these are Eigen functions or Eigen vectors why am I doing this why why is it important that they are Eigen vectors or Eigen functions because I know that I want to get my Eigen values in the largest Eigen value am I making sense I know from my iteration matrix somewhere along the line I want I want to do the ratio test let me not just say that I want to get the largest Eigen value the largest Eigen value apparently comes from the ratio test so I will do the ratio test in some fashion then ask the question for what value will the ratio test right give me the the, the smallest change the smallest ratio or I should say the least change right okay so E x y so it uh, it turns out that it turns out that any one of these any one of these right any one of these which we call E L M or whatever uh, or any one of these can be now substituted into our differential equation our uh, finite difference scheme and we will see what it is that we get there okay so what do we have so we have uh, let us pick uh, Jacobi we will do Jacobi iteration we will do Jacobi iteration so Jacobi iteration so I will write this n plus 1 we have done this so many times mm. okay these i i plus 1 are spatial coordinates the spatial coordinates so we can actually substitute we can sample the function e x y can sample the function e x y right and substitute in here am I making sense in a similar fashion uh, I, 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 I guess I should not I should not have written it this way because this will cause you to think that there is a b also maybe I should not have written it in terms of phi I should have written it in terms of after all e n also satisfies e also satisfies del squared e does it satisfy Laplace's equation does del squared is del squared e equals 0. so we want this will be this will be for this will be for any n okay and del squared e equals 0 
what is this going to give us? Let me see if we go through with this E n plus 1 equals I am going to substitute now the function phi I am going to represent in terms of the function E I am going to represent in terms of these exponentials. So what do I have E n plus 1 at i j is 0 0.25 times E n at i j E n i plus 1 j plus E n at i minus 1 j plus E n at i j plus 1 plus E n at i j minus 1. They are all equal intervals. So, what is this going to give me? I plus 1 j, I minus 1 j. So, what is the relationship between uh, E of I plus 1 j at n and Eij? Is there a relationship between these two? One will be exponent some con some constant times n delta x or n n h, right? Uh, I'm sorry, not n. I plus one h x equals x i equals i times h because we are taking equal intervals. Right, I am slowly getting ahead of myself here and yj equals j times h, we are taking equal intervals, okay. So the relationship and eij would be of the form exponent, everything else is the same, ih, okay. So the relationship between ei plus 1j and eij would be just one e ex exponent of all of this coefficient times h times times h oh, I have made a mistake here you guys have not corrected me okay what is the mistake that I have made I am using i to be square root of minus 1 I am also using i as the subscript I should not do that you have to be very careful so henceforth henceforth Henceforth, I will switch to the notation PQ, P plus 1Q, P minus 1Q, PQ plus 1, PQ minus 1. You have to be very careful, right? P plus 1Q, PQ, P plus 1Q, PQ. Is that fine? Okay, because right now all of a sudden when I introduce Fourier series, I have decided that i equals square root of minus 1. When I could use a different i but I am likely to forget. So we will we'll just switch the notation, fine. And in your electrical sciences you may have used a j, you may have used a j instead of an i but it does not matter. We will stick to i equals square root of minus 1. So this equation, this equation using this information then becomes EPQ at n plus 1 equals 0.25 times exponent of i pi l by capital L plus exponent of minus i pi l by capital L plus exponent of i pi m by capital L plus exponent of minus i pi m by capital L the whole into epq at n is that fine they make a mistake 
I pi L into H you are right thank you I pi L into H H is very important here I pi L into H H is very critical for me okay so what we will do is in the next class we will see where we can take this right so in the next class what we are going to do is we will take the ratio we will take the ratio of the two and find out what is what is the what is the rate at which right uh, what is that growth the geometric growth that we are getting or the dk uh, what does gauss seidel what does gauss jordan do we will see if we can do something similar to similar by way of convergence to gauss seidel and so on is that fine okay thank you